Welcome back everybody on uh, part three here in our series on understanding vacuum tube amplifier schematics. And yes, you may have noticed I renamed this series. Um, it was called um, How to Read Vacuum Tube um, Schematics. And then I realized it's mostly focused on amplifiers and I'm getting a lot of questions that, uh, that go outside of just how to read a schematic into a little bit of how the amplifiers work and whatnot. So I've uh, been doing a little bit of content outside the original scope of this thing. So hang tight and let's have some fun today. Let's look at what we're going to focus on. If you happen to miss episode one, we went over a bunch of schematic basics. Um, in episode two, we went over power supplies. I covered a lot about transformers and chokes. Um, and whatnot and today we are going to dive into push-pull amplifiers with phase inverters this phase inverter thing seems to elude a lot of people and uh, seem to be this big mystery we're going to try to break that down a little bit today and help you understand a uh, couple push-pull amplifier schematics okay you may ask what is a uh, push-pull amplifier and um, this, this picture here, yes, this is a transistor amplifier, but I thought it did a really good job of showing um, kind of what a push-pull amplifier. So the basic design is your signal flows into the amplifier. Um, one of your output um, devices here, in this case a transistor, um, amplifies half of the signal and the other device amplifies the other half of the signal. Those two get added back together, and in adding those back together, uh, they play in the output as an amplified version of the input. If you'll notice up here, I said class A, single A, single ended amplifiers are biased to conduct all the time. Um, and biasing is something I assume I'm going to get into here in another video. I may just do a separate video on what the heck is uh, uh, biasing a tube amplifier. But uh, the short version is basically setting all the parameters around the tube and its operating conditions to determine, um, you know, kind of how that tube operates in the circuit is, is a short version of biasing. But um, push-pull amplifiers, which are typically biased class AB, are biased just above idle. In other words, just so they don't turn off and have to turn back on every time um, their part of the signal comes through. So just a little bit, a little bit turned on above idle, and um, they conduct um, kind of 50% of the time. So it's kind of the difference between. Um, you know, driving your car with the foot on the gas pedal to the floor all the time. That would be a class A amplifier. And class B would be kind of, you know, hey, you only give it gas when you need to go. Um, you know, maybe you stop at a stop sign. Now imagine coming to a stop sign and putting your car in neutral but still keeping your foot on the gas pedal floored to the floor. That would be how a class A amplifier operates all the time. It is completely turned on, conducting 100% all the time whether there's a signal there or not um, whereas in a class B you know just imagine you know you come to a hill you take your foot off the gas you coast down the hill uh, similar thing when there's no signal for a class um, you know class AB push-pull amplifier you're really not um, amplifying anything at that point in time so just think about what I just said. Um, you know, if your car ran with the gas pedal on the floor 100% of the time, all the time, whether you're stopped, going, whatever, your engine would wear out sooner. And the same thing happens in a single-ended amplifier. That tube is conducting the output tube all the time. Um, thus, the life of the tube is less. So push-pull amplifiers, life of the tube is much longer. But guess what? You have to have two output tubes. You can't just have one. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. So in the case of a transistor amplifier, you can go buy an NPN transistor and you can buy a matching PNP transistor, which is kind of a, you know, just a um, complete opposite. One's a positively focused um, transistor, the other is a negatively focused transistor designed to uh, 
operate um, on negative voltages. And so um, due to that, you can kind of feed these things directly. And this and the, the fact you can set some really clean cutoffs on your uh, on your transistor bias, and you can set this one to only amplify the top halves, and this one to only amplify the bottom halves, and then you can kind of add them together in a very simple circuit. It's not quite so simple in a tube amplifier. Let's take a look at that. So if you think about an amplifier and you've got something like a KT88 output, there's really no such thing in the tube world as the PNP version of that KT88 output tube. So the fact that you don't have kind of a positively focused tube and a negatively focused tube, um, you kind of got to get tricky then. And because uh, so you're working with uh, kind of two positively focused tubes here. Um, and that's where it introduces something called phase inverters, or otherwise known as phase splitters. And this is what they do. They take in one signal, and somehow they create two signals for the output. One of, those out, one of those output signals is identical to the input, and the other is a mirror image or an inverted flipped version of the input, otherwise known as a phase shifted version of that. So you kind of see here in this picture a preamp signal in. Um, then you're feeding off the plate here, and you notice this is RP, a, uh, the, uh, the plate resistor. And you're feeding out, and you're getting, um, anytime you feed into a triode, um, into the grid, and come out the plate, you will always get an inverted version of your input signal. For single-ended, that's fine, because um, your ear can't tell the difference between one a signal that's inverted or not. Um, and then if you pull a signal off of the cathode, um, it will match the signal on the plate but it will be in phase with the signal on the grid. And so this is typically here called a cathodyne or sometimes called a split load circuit. And many push-pull amplifiers use this simple little circuit here to create two outputs um, 180 degrees flipped from each other. Um, one thing to note about this though, a cathodyne signal, um, stage like this has no gain. So whatever you feed into it here, let's just say you've got a uh, 100 millivolt signal, on the output here you would have a 100 millivolt signal on each one of these um, outputs. Okay, a couple other things. Um, in an amplifier that has a cathodyne uh, phase splitter or phase inverter, um, typically you will see a gain stage in front of that. Um, sometimes after that, but typically in front of that to um, actually amplify the input signal coming into the amplifier so that it's of a larger nature when it goes into this so it can come straight out of this and feed into the output tubes. Um, so think about that. You'll always need a second gain stage of some sort in an amplifier that uses a cathodyne circuit. All right, this is a little tougher one to understand, but I'm going to try to explain it the best I can. Um, this is the method two, otherwise known as the long tail pair. Very, very common guitar amplifiers, um, often seen in hi-fi amps as well. So um, you kind of take in your preamp signal here, and you feed it into the first tube, or first half of a tube. In a lot of cases, this is just one physical tube, like maybe a 12AX7, and these are the two halves of that tube. You feed into the grid here, and then you take one output here, and you, remember what I told you before, anytime you feed into the grid of a, a triode and take from the plate, um, that's an inverted output, so you could take that. Well, imagine if you kind of bias this tube here so that you got some gain, uh, let's just say a gain of 10x, uh, 10 times, coming off of the grid to plate to feed then to your power tube. Um, you would also then, if you'll notice, this is kind of unique here, you then, you've tied the cathodes of these two tubes together. Well, anytime you take the signal um, feeding into a grid off of the cathode of a tube, it is called unity gain. So you cannot create gain in a tube by taking the output signal off of the cathode, but you can off of the plate depending on how you bias the amplifier. In the previous one I showed you, uh, intentionally we had biased the um, plate to not create any gain, 
and because the pulling off the cathode doesn't create any gain, then you end up with that phase inverter. Well, what this does is maybe the pull of the pull off the plate here, we've biased it to give it gain. And then because the cathode here feeding this one has unity gain, you can then look at this as kind of a second stage amplifier here um, being fed via this cathode instead of via the grid and you can actually cause amplification here and you get to your power tube um, with an in phase amplified version that kind of matches um, the the same signal as the uh, you're pulling the output here so you end up not only with phase splitting but you end up with amplification in this type of stage and this is the same exact uh, schematic drawn a little differently that makes it easier to see. You feed into the grid, you take your plate off straight out to the power tube, you come off of the grid with a unity gain signal, so no amplification, then you're basically feeding it into this tube uh, for some amplification and then out into your power tubes here. So um, both of these scenarios, method one, method two, both work really well. You see this long tail pair used a lot in uh, guitar amplifiers. Um, and there's some reasons why, but I'd have to dive deep into biasing, and I'm going to avoid that at this point in time. Let's dive into some of our examples here. Circuit example number five in this series is the Dynaco ST70. You cannot pick a more um, <laughs> common push-pull amplifier that exists on this planet. There were hundreds of thousands of these things made. Um, there are a lot of them. They were sold either in kits or completely assembled. But I went to the actual manual, uh, the install, um, instruction manual that comes with a Dynaco ST70 if you had bought one. And I scrolled through and I found the schematics inside the manual. And this is what you would get. Um, there was a whole page that looked like this. And then there was a second page that looked like this. Well, hey, if you followed my second video, you should know, wow, that's power supply. And you could probably sit here and walk through all the aspects of this power supply at this point in time. Um, and then what you've got here, it, remember the Dynaco ST, that stands for stereo. It is a stereo amplifier, so it actually has two complete um, output amplifiers basically built onto one chassis. Um, if you'll notice, the input feeds here, goes through the, some stages, gets to the outputs, and feeds into an output transformer to a set of speakers, and you do the same thing. Let's say this is left channel, you do the same thing over here with the right channel, you feed it through, go to the output, you have a stereo amplifier. Well, well I'm going to focus, I'm going to just kind of break it down like we've taught you, and I'm going to focus on this today. Before I leave this page, though, I do want to mention a concept to you. Sometimes you hear people talk about monoblock amplifiers. And a monoblock is where you have one amplifier output section and maybe preamp section, just like in this orange box, on it, a chassis by itself with a power supply by itself. And that would feed, so your left channel of your, of your uh, stereo setup. Then you would have a completely separate chassis with um, a completely separate amplifier preamp section and power supply um, in there for the second channel. And you may say, well, why would that be better than doing what Dynaco did here and putting this all on one chassis? Well, here is why. Let's say that this um, top part, your left channel, at any given second happens to be amplifying a note from a, uh, I don't know, a uh, cello or something, a fairly high note. Um, and treble notes don't take a ton of power to produce. Um, and let's say at that same instantaneous second, the right channel happens to be amplifying um, some really big bass component. Um, maybe, uh, you know, a bass drum, a bass guitar note or something. Bass notes uh, take a lot of power to amplify, and yet you only have one power supply over here feeding this thing. So it's possible that the left channel here, amplifying the bass note, really swamps this power supply really hard, and it doesn't leave enough uh, reserve capacity there to power the right, um, the right channel efficiently at the exact same instantaneous moment. And thus, um, your, your high signals may get 
affected a little bit by the amount of what's going on uh, in the base and the other channel. And, um, you know, really good power supply design and kind of over engineering your power supply to have enough reserve capacity. Uh, there's something called damping factor that plays a role in this. But it really helps to eliminate some of that. Uh, but truly, if you know you want to eliminate that completely, build two separate chassis, two separate power supplies as a set of mono blocks. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, this is the little orange cutout I showed in the uh, previous diagram. But if you'll notice, we're feeding in here with a typical sine wave into the RCA jack of this amplifier. And we're coming along in here and we're feeding into uh, the grid of what looks to be a pentode tube here. And um, then we're taking the output of this tube from the um, grid here, I mean from the plate, into what looks to be a triode over here. This is a little triode. And we're feeding the grid of this triode. So if you'll notice, anytime you take and feed the grid and take off the plate, you ended up with an inverted signal here. Then we're going to feed from this um, pentode into the triode. And the triode then, you're going to take two outputs from it. So if you'll recognize this at this point, you'll take a, an output here that feeds over that, by the way, since you took it from the plate, is inverted yet again. Uh, so kind of back to the original. And then you're going to take one from the cathode here, which would be um, non-inverted that would match what's going into it right here. So then you've got kind of your 180 degree um, phase inverted version of the signal here at this point. And because you came off the cathode here, if you'll remember, um, we called that unity gain or no gain. So whatever size signal comes in is what comes out. The same up here on this one. So if that's the uh, phase inverter here, well then guess what this stage is? It is, you're right, it's the gain stage. And um, all these resistors right here, um, are really just designed to bias this tube. And I'm going to do a video, uh, probably a two-part series, on just on biasing. Um, but, you, you know, as far as the, back to the core of this uh, thing, it was about how to read and understand schematics. So just know these are resistors, 330K, 1.5 meg, 270K. And this little box that's drawn right here for the ST70, what it's basically showing you is there is a printed circuit board on the front of an ST70. And it, th what that's saying is that's what's inside that circuit board. And remember I talked about these little tag points or where you would feed wires to connect to that circuit board. Um, so it's a little, showing a little bit of physical on a logical diagram here. But then you've got your two... Um, inverted or your your non-inverted and your inverted signal at this point you feed through a couple coupling capacitors here because you don't want to feed the grids of this next tube with the high voltage that you would have sitting um, on the plate and or cathode of this tube um, and you feed it along here into the grid of the el34 in this case and this el34 is then biased to only amplify kind of part of this signal um, and so it's biased to, to just above turn on, remember? So it's only amplifying half the signal. I probably should have drawn that here. Um, in this case, it'd probably be um, amplifying the top half of this signal. And then this one is biased just the opposite. Um, and it is amplifying the bottom half of the signal. And then they get added together here in the output transformer. And um, then what you actually see on the output here would be your um, reassembled signal that has lots of amplification to it. Just a few more things on this schematic before we leave it I thought would be worth calling out. Um, first and foremost, um, here on the output tubes, if you'll notice the cathodes are tied together with a single resistor to ground. And that is the cathode bias resistor, this 15.6K ohm. And um, what that means is that both of these tubes are being biased with a single resistor on the output. What that forces is it forces you to have very well matched tubes here in the output because they're, they're being put into the exact same circuit conditions. 
And so um, some amplifiers that are a little more sophisticated than the ST70, you would actually see each one of these tubes have a resistor um, and maybe even a variable resistor of some type um, tied to ground here between their cathodes. And the reason for that is it gives you independent tube bias. So let's say this tube has just a little more gain to it than this tube because this one um, maybe it's just an older tube and it's something you had as a spare and uh, you put it in the amplifier. You could actually then adjust the bias on these two tubes separately so that they were basically amplifying the same even though that one tube is a little more worn than the other. Um, but in a case where you've got a common tied cathode to ground, common bias here, cathode bias, you better have two fairly matched tubes. Otherwise, you're going to be amplifying one part of this signal more than the other part of the signal down here. When you add them back together, you end up with kind of a wop-sided signal, and that ends up as distortion in your amplifier, which is not what you want in a hi-fi amplifier. Sometimes you'll see a uh, amplifier, I'll give you an example, like the Dynaco ST35. It has a common um, cathode biased on the output uh, tubes. And sometimes when you buy a uh, upgrade kit, um, I know that Dave Glipsky sells some that are um, designed to kind of change the bias in an ST35. And that's what he actually does in those little kits is he splits apart the bias so you can adjust each independently. And I've seen similar uh, setups or kits made for the uh, for the ST70. The other thing I thought I would show you is see this little tube right here where you had a pentode which was being used for your gain stage and then you had a triode that was being used for your unity gain phase splitter here otherwise known as a uh, cathodon circuit. Well guess what that is the 7199 tube. I think this is a really cool tube. Um, so inside the glass envelope of this tube you actually have two tubes inside of one one which is a pentode, one which is a triode. So when you look at the amplifier, even though it looks like it's two separate tubes here, this is one glass envelope, one tube. Very cool setup. Okay, this was just a random EL84 push-pull amplifier schematic I found online. I have no idea who, who designed this or what amplifier it was used in. But I um, thought I'd just walk you through it left to right here. First and foremost, you're feeding in via the RCA jack through a coupling capacitor. You'll see that a lot of times. Um, you'll see a coupling capacitor used on the front end of an amplifier. Typically, it's designed to decouple this uh, preamp stage here from whatever you know was being fed into this thing from another stage. Um, and then you'll notice here you're going into um, R1, written as one meg, and um, it is a variable potentiometer, which then feeds into this 220 ohm resistor. So guess what this is? If you guessed volume control, you are right. Um, then you're feeding into a grid resistor on this uh, tube here. And if you'll notice, this is an ECC83, otherwise known as the 12AX7, one of the most popular tubes ever made. Feeding into one side of it, um, and then you notice, hmm, the output of this thing goes up and then comes over here and feeds through this coupling capacitor, through this grid resistor, into the grid of an EL84 right here. But you're wondering, hmm, I don't quite, ah, I see what's going on here. Notice what's happened? These two cathodes are tied together, right? And then you've got your two balanced resistors here going up to B+. Plus. These are what give it the name long-tailed pair. Um, and then you're feeding out, remember, so really what's happening here is what I had showed you earlier in that um, long-tailed pair. Really this tube here is feeding the output here, but you're taking also the output out of the cathode of this thing, and you're feeding it over into the cathode of this tube, um, which is then being amplified basically through this tube right here, and being sent out inverted through this coupling capacitor, through this grid resistor, into the grid of the second EL84. And then you basically uh, take the outputs of those off the plate here into the output transformer, outputs off the plate into the output transformer. 
those two signals get added back together and your output is reassembled. A um, couple interesting things about this amplifier. Yes, indeed. Look at this, though. They use separate resistors here going to ground. So this, this cathode feeds through R14, which is 180R. And then this one here feeds through 180R to ground, uh, if you'll notice here. And then you've also got some cathode bypass capacitors here in parallel with that. But the good news was um, these things are independently biased at that point in time, but they're still using um, fixed resistors here in the bias of this. Okay, here, let's talk about a classic. This is a Fender Deluxe, not the reverb, but the uh, kind of the classic Fender Deluxe. And if you'll notice here, what you've got is two inputs on this uh, amplifier. So if you looked at the face of uh, Fender Deluxe, there's two inputs there. You could plug a, uh, maybe a, you know, a guitar into one, the microphone into the other, um, or whatnot. And, um, or two guitars, two guitars could be playing. Um, so you got two inputs here, one feeding one part of a 12AY7, the other feeding another part of a 12AY7. At that point, we're kind of bringing the outputs of these things here together, um, somewhat adding them together here, and feeding them then into the grid of the first part of a 12AX7. So what you'll notice here is, um, you know, a couple of these are potentiometers back here. These are kind of for volume control. And when you're then feeding into this 12AX7, which is the first half of it, happens to be your gain stage right here. So you're taking the signal off of the um, plate here of the um, first stage of the 12AX7, feeding it in through coupling capacitor into the grid of the second tube here. So you've just done some amplification here. And this is your cathode bias resistor and your cathode uh, bypass resistor on that. And then what you're doing is you're feeding into the grid of this and you're taking two signals out of this. So one, you're taking a signal out of the, off the plate here. Um, by the way, in this case, it is at unity gain, so no gain on this stage. Feeding through a coupling capacitor into the grid of your 6V6 here. Ignore this red. Um, it was on the schematic when I, when I uh, borrowed it. And you're also taking then a signal off of the cathode here, which is also at unity gain. And you're pulling it off and sending it down through another coupling capacitor into the grid of this uh, second 6V6 here. If you'll notice, the cathodes of these two tubes are tied together with a single uh, cathode bias resistor here going to ground and a cathode bypass resistor. So similar thing I talked about earlier, boy, you better have these two output tubes here matched in this case. Um, you're then feeding the signal out of the plate of this into the output transformer, plate of this into the output transformer, um, which is then being taken out to your 8-ohm speaker jack as this thing is reassembled. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to you. It's a, ta it's a classic cathodyne circuit right here, um, feeding your two push-pull 6V6 GT outputs. Few interesting things to note. Let's say you've got a tube tester at home and you're testing 12AX7s, right? Um, and you find some that aren't balanced, okay? So maybe the first stage has pretty good, uh, first part of it has pretty good gain to it, but the second one's at 70% or something like that. That would be a prime candidate tube to put in this place right here because you get your gain off the first part of the tube and um, you don't even need any gain on the second part here. So um, kind of the unity part of this thing would work just fine even with an unbalanced tube here in this section of the amplifier. Um, but when it comes to this stage right here, you're going to want these two tubes fairly well matched. Otherwise, you're amplifying one part of the signal more than the other. But let's go back and look at this long tail pair one. Remember, this stage is not only um, performing phase splitting, but also amplification at the same time. And so you kind of need both halves of this tube here to be able to amplify the same amount. So this, in this scenario, you better have a 12AX7 right here that both sides of that tube um, are very well matched. Otherwise, let's say one of them was at 
and the other, it's kind of its mutual conductance readings, were at a uh, 70 percent. Well, then you're going to be sending a signal along here that, that got amplified 100 percent on one side and 70 percent on the other side. By the time that gets mixed in the output here and amplified, um, you're going to have a good bit of distortion in your outputs. Um, so pay attention to where it makes where you have to have balanced tubes and where you don't have to have exactly matched and balanced tubes. Okay, any good instructor would leave you with some homework. I'm going to I'm going to challenge you go out and pull up the Fender Deluxe schematic and uh, kind of walk the whole thing through now that you've seen the power supply and you've seen kind of the um, the output stage here. So if you can walk through it and um, you know figure out which pieces you don't understand and would like to know more about and have questions, maybe do the same for the Dynaco ST70. That would be a good one to walk through. You can find the uh, uh, Hi-Fi Engine has a nice uh, schematic for that. But hopefully um, you guys and gals are enjoying this series. I'll keep it going if people uh, have interest and continue to watch it. and. Uh, and ask for more. So stay tuned and uh, we'll, we'll make another one soon. Thanks everyone.